and welcome to Modern Kit Stuff and part 9 of our U9 build. Right then, most of the main component components are, are on. Um, we've added the booms fore and aft. We've added the masts. Um, we have put the hatch on in the open position. We have the machine guns on, um, and I think that is everything other than the canvas cover and railing section for the top of the conning tower. So before we put the uh, conning tower on or do anything else with the rigging, we need to clear coat this. And I'm going to use um, a satin clear coat. Um, and what we'll do is we will clear coat everything from the waterline up in the satin. Um, and then what we'll do with the lower hull ultimately is we want that to be matte. And when we've finished, um, we want there to be a contrast between the lower hull and the, and the upper hull. Um, the um, little red covers, um, they'll be picked out in, in matte and the booms will be picked out uh, in gloss. So there will be um, different sheens um, which will give us, um, give us a, a general sense of reality to, um, to it. Um, now, we need to put the conning tower cover on before we add the rig in. Um, it's much more difficult to get in and, and, and get the clear coat on for the rigging and as we're using um, EZ line um, we don't want to um, get, in, get in the way of that. Um, you'll notice that we used EZ line for the um, rigging of the turnbuckles around um, the, the rudders and, and the uh, dive planes. Um, once it's painted, EZ line behaves differently and it becomes um, stiffer. Um, so, natural EZ line, you can you can flex it, um, and it really doesn't uh, doesn't mind. Once you've painted it, if you flex it, it will it will stretch, but it'll stay in that in that stretch. Um, it might slowly come back and, and contract over time, but generally it behaves much more differently. You could also crack the paint, obviously, um, so that's worth worth noting. Um, so the only thing that is not fixed in place other than the um, conning tower cover is the flag staff that I broke off earlier um, because I want to actually add the flag to that. We'll take advantage of uh, breaking that part. Um, so um, the flag decal is already on its um, foil backing, ready to go. Um, and we've also got to um, add the um, two screws, which I won't be doing in brass. I'll be doing in bronze. Um, and then it's just a case of, of uh, weathering. So my satin um, clear coat is um, dry. Uh, and now we're putting the rigging on using the EZ line. Um, it's quite um, quite a, a simple process, really. Um, we're starting with um, a little dab of CA glue on the little protrusion on the mast, and then. Replacing the end of the line with a pair of tweezers, um, and it grabs almost instantly. So we just have to place it and hold it there for a sec. Then we estimate how much we need. 
leaving enough to be able to pull it tight. Snip that off. And then we just thread it through the eye that we, uh, those photo etched little eye bolts that we put on. So, now we're not going to be painting this rigging, we're going to leave it um, in its natural uh, black. Uh, and all we're going to do is pull the line taut and a dab of super glue again. Hold it for a sec, uh, and there you go. That's done, um, and we'll go around in a moment and and trim off all the extra ends. Um, but that is all there is to add in the rigging lines. Let me get this a bit closer for you. It's a very simple process. Okay, so we are now starting our process of doing the weathering. Um, so my first step has been some black panel line um, wash which is just to add a base of uh, dirt and, and shadow uh, really. Um, and We don't apply it with the brush applied, we, we use a, a narrow paintbrush, a small paintbrush. Um, and you can see what we've done is we've gone around some of the rivet detail. Uh, we've gone and done the panel lines on the deck, on the upper deck. Um, we have done the insides of all of these um, little holes uh, along the side of the ship. Uh, we've done the base of the masts. Uh, we've done um, anywhere where we've got a bit of shadow to apply. And that just starts our process off. It starts highlighting the detail. We've also done um, the turnbuckles as well. Um, and so, I, yeah, um, anything that I felt had a raised detail that I wanted to, to highlight. I've not done most of the rivets along the side because uh, I don't want to overpower it. Um, and I want natural light to be part of the, the look of this. Um, but if we just get the bowing view here, you can see I've done a little bit of highlighting. There, so these, uh, these parts, whatever they are, send out better. Um, we've done some stuff around this large rectangular steel plate that's riveted on um, but we're only at the start of of the journey for that so there's more layers to go on um, the other thing that I've already done is I've used uh, the same product but in brown um, and we've just done the inside of the white hatches uh, see if we can get that on camera and that just gives them a sort of used, worn, aged look. Um, one thing that I don't know a lot about submarines, but one thing I do know is they weren't very fresh on the inside, and so I want to reflect that on the inside of the of the hatch. Um, so uh, next thing I want to do is these little red, four little red cloches that we've got um, and to start with I just want to add some shadow I'm going to do that by using a really dark red so we'll do that next. My wash that I'm going to use um, to start my rusting process, this isn't the only thing we're going to do to emulate rust, we're going to use some pastels as well. Um, I'm using uh, Vallejo's Dark Rust um, which I, I find works out really well as a as a base layer for 
for rust on ships. Um, so if you want to do the the um, rusting anchor part on the bow um, from the hose pipe, um, I, my process tends to be dark rust, um, then a little bit of um, streaking um, with some pastels, and you can get a really nice effect. So. So I don't know if you can see that, but we've done a little bit of chipping, started a, um, a chipping process. Um, I'm going to do perhaps a little bit more chipping. In fact, yeah, we'll do some more chipping. Let me just show you how we go about the chipping first. So I like to use burnt iron for um, chipping on ships. Um, what it, the, the colour of this... Um, is a nice combination of bare metal with a, a hint of rust but it also means that if I want to go over that with rust it gives me a, a nice uh, depth to that to that rust colour so um, I've used this um, a few times now uh, and I've always been happy with how that comes out uh, as a base for a lot of things I'm using a very fine brush um, and uh, I mean, this is this paint's ready thin for for airbrush. So this is how thin it is. And all I'm doing is deciding where I might see a paint chip and painting it on. So it's little dabs um, and little scratches and then some of those scratches we can get rust coming from so I'll do a little bit and show you what that looks like I'll just turn this round so you can see it there we go so you can see there quite a bit of activity from the rope around this part here and then we'll put a little bit of rust on there and then we've, we've put a little scratch along the side and when we get to the conning tower obviously that's a congregation point so the, the chipping is going to get a, perhaps a little bit heavier again around here and particularly on this handrail where they're possibly taking the canvas on and off and people are leaning on it so I'm gonna fairly heavily chip the top of this rail so I've completed the chipping on one side of the hull and I just wanted to show you that before I carry on with the rest I've tried not to overdo it um, sometimes a bit of a challenge um, so we've gone fairly heavy around the bow area here uh, we've got a raised area here so we've done a little bit around there um, I've imagined these posts get quite a battering so that I've fairly heavily chipped them and some of these chips will lead nicely into the start of some rust streaks so we've then got some chipping here on the edges where there might be some footfall on the edge on this leading edge of the conning tower here and there's a little corner that sticks out that I imagine gets rubbed against and lent on and we've got some foot rungs there which I imagine would get fairly heavy traffic so a little bit of chipping around there um, occasional chipping along the whole edge just on this corner here and the occasional chipping around one of the little drain holes there um, then round the boom obviously that's been taken out and put back into place a little bit of chipping around the hatch area then again, fairly heavy around these parts, um, the flagstaff, these bits here, 
Um, a little bit of uh, fairly heavy chipping on the posts again. And a, just a little bit on this upper rudder effect. So just where you think people are going to come in contact. So I'm going to go and do the other side now. And then we're ready for doing some rust. Um, so now our chipping has dried. Uh, we can apply our initial rust. Um, so again, we're going to apply it in the same way as we did the, the chipping. And we're going to just put it on with a very fine brush. So we want a combination of um, streaking rust, um, rust spots, all of which we can do with this fine brush. So again, I'm going to start at the bow. Um, and I'm expecting that this area here would be relatively heavily rusted. And you're going to have lots of water just cascading down here in rough seas. And when you're out in the Atlantic, you don't get a lot of seas that are quite calm. So plenty of rough seas. There we go. Now, that doesn't look perfectly natural right now. But by the time we've finished doing our process, it'll look fine. Now when you put in shape in this, when you've finished, always drag the brush back up to the top. Otherwise you get a heavy blob of wash at the bottom of what you've painted and you want it at the top. What you don't want is it to look like a run of paint. Okay, I think that looks suitably busy. So heavier at the bow again, not so much along the length, um, around the bow planes and where we've got these sort of, where we've got this rigging and, and stuff, we'll do a bit round there. Anywhere where this chip in, we might put some rust, um, but we don't have to. Um, so I'm going to go up through this. Um, it's quite a laborious um, process. So I'm going to put some tunes on and um, I'll get back to you when we're done. Okay, so we've done the paint chipping. We've gone round with um, a rust wash and we've put rust in the areas where uh, we think it looks right. So the next thing we need to do is go round with some pastels and I'm using this sort of rust coloured pastel. Um, and I'm using a very, very stubby little paintbrush. Um, I've struggled to find an angle where you can see what I'm doing um, closely enough for it to make sense. So we'll start here at the bow um, and then we'll move backwards. And what we want to do is have a look at each individual rust chip and assess whether it's okay as it is or whether it needs something extra. I'm going to start in a big area um, so you can see what I'm doing more easily. Um, but here where we've got this big um, multiple rust streaks that have come together as one, um, that's an area that we want to put some pastel over. So I'm going to start at the top. And what you'll see as you brush over it is you're getting a very slight rusty orangey colour um, and what it's doing is it's blending the rust wash and the chip together so the chip becomes less subtle and it softens the edges of the uh, of the of the wash
and it just looks a little bit more natural. So now it looks like the chip has started to rust slightly and has uh, surface oxidation um, and where it's gone down over these pre-existing chips um, you can see that that rust has sort of trickled down there and then there's some on the paintwork that where there wasn't rust before um, so it just gives you that feel that it's the oxidation that's been flushed out by the water and that's sort of what we're looking for we're looking for something that makes this soften a little bit and look a little bit more um, natural um, and in use. I'll have one or two other sort of um, colours we can use. We've got some browns and we've got some, some yellows that we'll just, uh, we can mix up as, as and when we feel that we need to. But right now we'll go around with this little orange and see what happens. So where we've got water collecting and we've put um, rust along there again it softens the edges just gives you a feel of something that's been there for a while so if you want it to be fresh rust um, you you want to leave it as you've done it with the drip um, with the paintbrush when you put it on as a wash just leave it and that looks a little bit more so I'm going to put some around this front area here because that's where the ropes and things will go And around this bow. So if you want to make it look a little heavier, you just go over it um, more. And if you want it just light, you just dust over it. So like I'm doing with these rivets, and it's putting small amounts on, and it just gives you an ever so subtle, ever so slight effect. Now I have another brush here, which is even a bit more stubby, um, and I've got a little mix of uh, browns and greys and, and the rust colours, which we used on the stack there. Um, and I'm going to use this for areas where I want a darker rust effect. So in this little gap here. So where this sticks out and I know water's gonna settle, I'm using this sort of brownie mix. So it adds another tone. Um, and this is all very subtle and quite time consuming, but um, yeah, it's worth the effort. So we've got a little scratch here um, and I want to do a little bit of rust coming off from there. So obviously at the, the bow there's lots of water action. So we did put a little bit of rust at one end but we didn't put any on the rest of it. So if we start at the end where we put a bit of rust and just dump a bit on and drag it down and then I've got a rust spot there that's quite heavy, so I want to drag that down a little bit as well. And then I'm just going to take one of these sort of dotted scratches and pull down a little bit from there. And about the same length as the others, so it looks like it would have all started rusting at the same time. So. Um, 
and what we're sort of implying is that that's the first impact so it's slightly deeper so you can see where the rust is uh, is coming down where we didn't put a rust wash so if I now use this uh, darker rust and just put a little bit on that start point I'm going to do the same with that little rust spot And I'm just dappling a little bit around those scratches. And it is very, very subtle. Um, but eventually you get to something that well, just looks right. Now a really good reference for weathered warships is photographs from the 1982 Falklands conflict because you have lots and lots of colour photographs of warships that have been travelling through the Atlantic um, and then have gone into war um, and you'll be amazed at the state of some of those ships. just want to show you this um, photograph. So this is um, an A-class destroyer, HMS Antony, um, actually the destroyer that my grandfather was serving on at the, at the start of uh, the Second World War. It tells a very funny story actually. Um, on the day the war broke out, um, they heard the news and they promptly put to sea um, and they really didn't know what to expect uh, and so they went and depth charged a shoal of fish. And it always makes me smile, that story. Sounds a bit like something out of Ed's um, Army or something like that. Anyway, um, the reason I'm showing you this picture is this is a pre-war photograph of HMS Anthony. And there's two things there that um, really stand out to me from this picture. One is, if you look at the two funnels, you can see the, the shine on them. Ships are not matte. They are shiny they are semi-gloss the paintwork is satin um, and i think it's always really important to remember that um, they are not matte now obviously you have scale effect which might map them down if you're doing 1700 but i think model ships always look better um, when they're not matte just my point of view but the thing i really wanted to show you which is the, the second thing here is look at all the streaking down that hull lots and lots of grimy streaks some of it is salt streaks some of it is that sort of gray grimy streaking you get from from the weather from the dirt that's knocking around and and so on um, and this is pre-war when the ship's being maintained this isn't in a war setting where they've not got time because they've been on convoy duty this is how dirty these ships get um we need to do that on the u-boat so Let's go and think about streaking grime. Um, okay, so I have a little set of pastels here uh, which have a range of greys to whites. Um, and we're going to use these for um, just a bit of streaky grime. Um, and I'm going to use the same process that we used before. So um, I've got a brush that's got some bristle on it it's relatively soft um, and it's going to allow me to both um, dapple and drag 
uh, which is sort of what we're looking for. So we're, we're looking for a dragging motion just down the side and I'm actually going to use uh, my grandfather's ship photo as a sort of a reference. And what You can see that, that, um, that looks quite authentic to me, so we'll go with that colour and then we might do two or three layers where we want to darken it. So let me crack on with that and show you what that looks like when it's done. Okay, so uh, again apologies that I'm having to handhold the uh, camera here, um, but the weathering is completed, we've done the dirt streaks, I think that takes me as far as far as I want to go with the weathering of this. So I will take some photos and do a little bit of video and give you a better look at that. You can see that I've also done the um, stand. Um, so in the instructions it gives you a couple of options. Uh, white with black letters, black with white letters. Uh, you can see which one I've gone for. Uh, and then you have a decal that goes into that little box there. Um, the other thing that uh, I've done, again I'll take a photograph because I don't want to lift the U-boat off its stem now, but um, a couple of little strips of red felt um, just where the U-boat sits to stop the hull getting scratched um, because I need to lift it off once in a while for a, for a dust or to move it. I would say that this is very flimsy and it might be worth putting an additional support in the middle if you come to move this it flops all over the place um, so yeah it's quite flimsy um, but looks good when when painted up in fairness so uh, let's just very quickly jog through the build of this um, and then we'll show you some video we'll show you some pictures of the completed thing uh, and I'll give you my final final thoughts on this kit so um, in terms of the weathering, our process has uh, basically started with um, clear coating the lower hull in matte and the upper hull waterline up in um, a satin finish. Um, then we've done the paint chipping and we use that burnt iron paint for that. Um, and then we've used um, a rust wash to do some more um, paint chipping, basically um, some rust and some rust streaks. We've then followed that up with um, a rust coloured um, pastel um, and gone round where, wherever we've put rust spots uh, and looked at whether we need to do something more with them, putting a bit more streaking on. And then we've done some additional um, rust spots with just the pastel. We've then gone round with a darker mix of pastel, which was the one that I originally did uh, for the funnel, um, which is a mix of the rust um, and a couple of different browns in there uh, just to give you a deeper rust colour uh, and we've done that around certain areas such as that, sorry about the shadow um, and that's just helps us um, have a, an, an uneven approach to the, the rust and give us an impression that we've got um, new rust and various different ages of rust. Um, and then using my grandfather's ship photo, we've gone along with um, a gray pastel and put the um, streaking grime on. Um, and you can see here, every one of these little drain ports has had it put on. It looks quite different on the darker gray than the lighter gray, but it gives you a witness of where the water runs. And I think that looks um, really authentic personally. Um, don't know what you guys think. Um, so there you go, that's the, the weathering done. And then the last thing we've done is put on the um, two screws, which have been sprayed in um, um, an ext uh, AK's Extreme Metal Brass, which is an enamel, and I put it through my airbrush. I don't usually put enamels through my paintbrush, so I very quickly give it a, a clean. I don't like using the levels in the airbrush. Um, so there it is, it's done. The flag staff has been added on. Um, the flag is a decal on some foil, which has then been posed. Um, yeah. 
So uh, I don't know if I overdid the weathering or underdid the weathering. I've tried my best to um, just think about the weathering process as I've gone through it. And I've held off doing more. And I've deliberately held off um, doing the um, below the waterline. So the reason for this is um, I like the effect of we got from um, spraying the paint um, the Humbrol dark grey over the pre-shading we did gave me a nice modulated look. Now normally on a ship what I do along the waterline is I do a little bit of rust, um, a little bit of green algae um, and, and some salt um, and on a, on a smaller scale warship I'm well versed in doing that. With this just being a larger scale I was a little bit concerned that I was going to overdo the weathering. Um, and so I think having that, I, the, underwater it doesn't rust and it doesn't weather quite anywhere near as quickly as above the waterline. So I think it just gives it a nice uh, presentation. Um, so partly I think it gives it a nice presentation and partly I didn't want to crack on with the weathering and, and make it look overdone. You could certainly go and put some... Um, salt streaks on to give it a slightly aged look and key into the top but I'm stopping here I'm done now so I, I don't know whether I've overdone it or underdone it I don't know what you guys think um, but when done model doesn't look so bad My final impressions uh, now that we've built the, the ship uh, well subject matter 10 out of 10 absolutely beautiful subject matter and I hope that this is the first of more um, early u-boats uh, early submarines that we see um, and, and more um, first world war um, ships generally. Um, build quality um, 9 out of 10. The only real problem with the fit of this straight out of the box is that upper deck that we had to cut in half and add a, a millimetre shim. Um, the um, rudder assembly is a little bit faffy but 
that's just being um, grumbly. It's not. It's not a problem. You can get it together okay. You don't need to modify anything to to make it fit. So, yeah, everything else. The the fit was either very very tight or just tight. There's there's no slack fit. There's no issues. I mean. Um, the bow planes, for example, are all just pushed in. They're not glued in place. So, no real issues there. Um, so, if you want to build this straight out of the box, um, then you're going to end up with something that looks pretty much like this. Um, so, is it value for money? Uh, no, I don't think so, um, and I'll come back to that. Now then, if you want to buy a model of the U9 and build it, um, putting aside the fact that this is the only one you can buy, um, what, what do you need to do? Well, you're going to need to modify the bow. Um, the bow shape is wrong, so you need to sort that out, and that means inevitably having to replace one way or another the rivets. You then need to understand what version you're doing, because Dazworks um, have got um, it a little bit muddled up. So if you're doing the early version, you want this mast and not these masts and you want that mast to be moved to there and that mounting point gone all together the mast was never there ever um, if you're doing the late version you want these two masts um, and you need to look at what you might change with the guns so if you're wanting to make um, an accurate u9 you need to do a lot more research because das boat despite how they've marketed it, haven't really done that. Right then, let's deal with the price tag um, and why I am quite disappointed with this kit. Um, the price tag for most people um, is around about £100 plus delivery. For that, you don't get much in the way of plastic um, and I don't think you get a hundred pounds worth of plastic but that is a premium price tag a hundred pounds is a premium price tag for a model and I know model prices are going up um, at the moment uh, for some companies and some countries um, not for everyone uh, at all um, but once you get into three figures, you're on a premium price tag and you expect a premium product and what you're getting, and I've said it before in, in other videos, this model, you're getting a fur coat, but it's got no knickers. It, it's all show, but the model ain't that. Not only do you not get much plastic, but you, they don't deliver what they've promised. Um, so, when I say it's fur coat and no knickers, look at the box artwork. Absolutely beautiful. Um, you'll notice that you've got the shiny print on it and you've got a matte finish on the box. That costs money. Anyone who's bought the kit will tell you that the box is much bigger than it needs to be for um, holding the sprue. Um, that you get. And then they've done this fancy book that comes at least with the initial release. Um, but I've not read this book. I've not read this book and it is huge. Why have I not read this book? Because I'm buying a model kit. If I was interested in the history of U9, I'd go and buy a book on it. It's one thing to have a potted history this is U9, this is why she's famous. Um, a couple of pages, not a whole book. It's not really a reference manual for building the model. Um, so actually, you're paying 
for lots of presentation and lots of fluff and lots of fanfares of trumpets, but you're not actually paying for a model kit. And as a modeler, that's what I'm spending my money on. I'm not spending my money on fancy boxes and fancy publications. So Dazworks have got this wrong. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think it's an increasing trend where the presentation of the kit um, almost becomes more important. And it's style over substance. And this is classically style over substance. The substance, the actual model kit you get, is not what is being promoted. Um, and it's not what's being promoted because when you hear about them diving down to measure it and it's got over 7,000 rivets, what it does is it puts in your mind, wow, this is going to be super accurate. And it's absolutely not. And what's even more annoying is you've got someone who's written this and pulled this together. You've got someone who's designed this. You've got someone who's done the box art. And for me, none of them ever I've got in a room and sat and had a conversation. It's not joined up. It's not. The book has, referen has pictures in here, which aren't really reference pictures, that prove that this is wrong and that their instructions are wrong. So if Dazworks wanted to know what this should look like, they only have to go as far as the book they gave us. This is page 34. And what you can see is that the stacks are two different colours. Their instructions, paint them both grey. What else you can see on here is that the mast there, this, this is the early version, it's just in the crack of the page, sorry. But the mast is there on the conning tower. There. Where that back telescope is. Not there. It was never there. So if they can get that picture, that reference material, in the book that they've put in the box with the kit, why can't they get it right on the instructions? I'm sorry, but that's unforgivable. That is wrong. That is a work of fiction. They have a, a picture of it rigged there. It was never rigged like that because the masts were never like that. Those two masts were never on the U-boat at the same time that that mast was. That mast was never in that location. It was there. And that's not the end of it. There are other pictures in here which you can use to get this right. Here's another picture of U9. And you can see here those two masts, but it doesn't have the short mast there. But look how look how dark that cover is. So what colour actually is the tarpaulin? Because unfortunately you can't trust the instructions because we now know they're wrong. Also, if you look at the hatches, that's where you can see the front of the hatches are painted in the light, not the dark. The instructions have you paint the whole thing dark. But that's not correct. And again, they only have to go as far as the book they put in the, the, the kit. So, unfortunately, my, my final impression is that Dazworks, for Dazworks, this was um, a project in how to sell models. They have, in, in my mind, they have relied on the fact that nobody else makes a model of U9. And when you look at what Dazworks are producing, that's what they produ produce. Nobody's ever done this before, so it will sell. And the lack of being bothered to do the research properly has really let this model down. Um, and as a result, that lets Dazworks down, and as a modeler, that means that I don't trust the next one that comes out. So, you know, a little bit le e less effort on where to put the coffee stains on the manual and a bit more effort on getting the model historically accurate would go a big way into making the, my view of that change. Okay, so that's my rant over. And um, I've not done enough videos for people to know that I don't rant. I, you know, if something's wrong, I'm going to highlight it. That's part of the reason for doing the videos, so people can see what the buy-in.
Okay. I'm going to leave you with some um, photographs of the finished model. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the build series. Um, so, yeah, thanks for watching, everyone. Stay safe. And um, that's the U9 done. See you again soon.